Welcome to your family's health. This is Professor Joan Buckley from the Department of Nursing here at Nassau Community College. Your family's health is a program focusing on health care issues and resources available to you here in Nassau County. But on the show, we speak to experts from around the country, and we want to keep you up to date on current health care issues and trends. And today we're going to be speaking to Mr. Dr. David Hanscom, um, and he's actually an orthopedic spine surgeon at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute in Seattle, Washington. So if you want to know more about how to stay healthy and more about his new book, Back in Control, stay tuned for the next half hour to the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. So welcome to the show, Dr. Hanscom. Thank you. Now, Dr. Hanscom, um, I gave a very brief introduction. You are a spine surgeon. And this is kind of an unusual um, show, actually, for a spine surgeon because the conversation is going to go in a different way than surgery. Um, right. So if you could just tell the listening audience a little bit about you're obviously a spine surgeon, but tell them a little bit about who you really are as a physician and healer. Well, I, I developed, I've been doing spine surgery for 30 years. And mm-hmm. Basically, I'm Seattle's senior spine surgeon. I do a lot of complex cases and redos and that type of stuff. But I spent about seven my seven of my first part of my career, seven years doing aggressive spine surgery, pretty much feeling that spine surgery was the answer for anybody who had failed non-operative care. And the results weren't very good. And in 1993, a report came out out of the state of Washington that a fusion for back pain had only a 25% success rate, and I just stopped doing fusions for back pain. But I did not know what to do, so I just stopped and did the best I could with non-operative care as far as back pain goes. And then I also developed chronic pain myself for about 15 years, which was a very horrendous experience. And it was a disaster. I almost didn't make it through. And I came out of that in around 2003. And in the last 10 years, I've been pain-free. I've done fine. And so the book came out of my personal experience with chronic pain. I started sharing, sharing these experiences and concepts with my patients, and they started going to pain-free. The first book was published in 2012, which was based on my experience and, patients, and my patients' experiences, but I didn't have that much neuroscience knowledge behind me. And then the last five years of neuroscience just exploded with new data on how chronic pain works. And the most recent book has been pretty much rewritten it's been much more effective, much clearer, where patients responded very quickly. And I've watched hundreds of patients go to pain-free, mostly without surgery. It's been a remarkable experience. Wow. Can you talk a little bit about the the one research study that you read? Now, you said you read many, and it, 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 it does get addicting, especially if a topic is of real interest to you. Right. So which one study did you read and just really knocked your socks off? You said, oh, my gosh, this really is... What I've been looking for, this is why I need to do X, Y, Z. What, what, what study was it that really, really speaks to this issue, that surgery is not always the answer for um, back pain and other, you know, problems? Well, there's a paper published out of Stanford in 2006 by Dr. Kerji, who performed a test called a discogram where they inject dye into the disc. And based on that discogram, they do an operation to get rid of back pain very, very carefully controlled study, and they found out that the success rate of a spine fusion for back pain was 22%. So that did it. There's still not one paper that I'm aware of that actually says surgery works. But the paper that really nailed it down in the neuroscience world yeah. was out of Chicago, where they showed that if someone comes in with acute, lack, acute back pain less than three months, that the pain center, called the nociceptive center, lights up in the brain, as you would expect, these, these functional MRI scans can tell which part of the brain is metabolically active based on which, which body part is painful. Then they found out by 12 months that the pain became chronic, that the pain center actually became quiet, that the pain completely shifted to the emotional center. So now you're doing surgery on pain, that's still back pain, but it has a different driver. So it turns out that chronic pain is a neurological problem and it is not a structural problem doesn't really matter where the pain starts. It could be a bone spur, it could be a ruptured disc, all sorts of stuff. But within a certain period of time, it becomes memorized. And once it's memorized, it's like phantom limb pain. People have their legs amputated and they still feel the pain. It can occur in any body part. It doesn't matter what you do surgically. So until you turn off that switch, 
that signals pain, you're not going to solve the problem. So what would be if, if I came to you or someone came to you and said, you know, I've had this, you know, I, it wasn't not necessarily an accident because we know a lot of um, back pain is really from just bid um, body positioning and overdoing things. Like people are not always back safe. So if someone came to you and said, you know, I have chronic back pain. It gets worse by the end of the day. It's killing me and it's been bothering me six or seven months. What could I expect on the first visit? or the first time that I think about using your approach? Well, well there's three parts of solving chronic pain. The first right. one is understanding chronic pain. The second thing is to understand that there are many parts of chronic pain, and we tend to apply simplistic solutions to a complicated problem. So what the book and what my book, Back in Control, does is simply a framework or sort of a prism that takes a complex topic and breaks it up into the smaller parts. So we find out that you have to deal with every aspect at the same time. Then the third part is the patient has to take control. So for instance, if you had back pain for seven months, I'd say, look, <clears throat> we had the physical part, which is stretching, strengthening, physical therapy, mm-hmm. good posture, body mechanics, that's number one. Um, second of all, if you're not sleeping, there's, there's a study out of Israel that shows that lack of sleep actually causes chronic pain. And it's not the other way around. So we would work on sleep, we work on physical conditioning, we might stabilize medications. And then there's a simple exercise that's, that's been documented in over 300 research papers, almost 400 now, where it's simply it's called expressive writing. And the health benefits of expre- expressive writing are unbelievable. You simply write down your thoughts and you tear them up. And we find out that basically your thoughts create the same adrenaline response that other negative impulses do. The problems that human, humans have that you, is that you cannot escape your thoughts. And so what happens when you try to escape your thoughts, suppress them, you tend to reinforce them, which really adrenalizes your nervous system, which actually increases the nerve conduction. So by writing down thoughts somehow breaks up that cycle, and it's remarkable. So I say, look, please go home and start this part of the process, which is simply writing down your thoughts, tearing them up, and then... There's a little process called active meditation, which is a little mindfulness exercise, where you simply put your brain on a sensation, and so you're switching off these permanent pain, pain pathways to taste, sound, touch, feel, whatever you want, mm-hmm. for five to ten seconds. So instead of battling thoughts or battling pain, you simply switch sensory input. Now, so, what? Go ahead. Right. So the, the website is the action plan of the book, and I say, look, this, this is the homework phase. You can learn about the pain, do these simple steps, and I'll see you back in two weeks. If I do just physical therapy or just the medication or just the sleep, it, it doesn't really work very well. I was just going to say that. Like if I'm in chronic pain and I picked up your book and I went to your website, I would focus on something I thought was the easiest thing for me to do, and I would expect results. So I would say right away that, oh, I can journal and I can rip up my pages and I'll go get a spiral notebook and I'll write, you know, I guess about my pain that day and get rid of it. But how about the mindfulness? Like, if can you do one piece at a time or do you really need to do it as a um, put the puzzle together and it functions much better? Or can you start with just one piece? Well, a lot of people that are, you can... So the answer is you can do actually anything you want. In other words, the (laughs) key issue, well, the key issue is you're taking control. So some people, so the only one common starting point has been the writing and tearing up. And you don't write down about your pain, you write down about anything. Anything, Positive or negative. The first book talks about negative writing because most people, most of the research has been done on negative writing. We write down negative thoughts, but it turns out it doesn't matter. You're simply separating from your thoughts. Oh, and you're refocusing almost. Well, you're just, using a different part of your brain, right? Because to write, you have to... I'm, a, I'm thinking, I'm not much into neuroscience, but if I have to write, if I even write in a diary, it takes my mind off what's the here and now. I have to go kind of back into a different space. Yeah, this is actually, this is a different energy to it. So the diary is important, and I think creative writing is important, but this is only a separation process. Mm-hmm. In other words... When you write, all these issues come up, but they're not issues; they're just thoughts, right? Right. And so, the reason I have people tear them up for tear them up for two reasons. One of them is to write with freedom, uh-huh. and the second is so you don't analyze them. 
because you're reinforcing them. So the hardest part, the hardest and easiest part about this project, is you, you're trying to create a true shift. In other words, you do all these different steps, you're not going to get better. So these steps do lead to a shift where you simply shift off of pain pathways onto non-pain pathways. The writing is only that foundational separation process. It's just like putting your toe into the water before you jump in the water. So it's just a starting point, and people start writing and writing and writing to solve the pain that actually doesn't work. So you're just separating from your thoughts. Maybe you can't, these are permanent pathways, mm-hmm. and you're not going to solve them. And so the hardest part is you can't fix yourself because your attention's still on yourself, which includes the pain. So what you're doing, you're separating and going in a different direction. It's like diverting a river into a different channel, One, and your brain will develop wherever you place its attention. So as you put your brain on simple sensations and relaxation and de the nervous system, your brain actually starts to physically change. In other words, on these research MRI scans, they actually can see the brain rewire. Wow. And the, the number of studies that you've mentioned, I mean, that's huge to find even 400 studies on one simple aspect. And you really are talking about narrowing it down to like one part, the writing. Um, so now in the past, though, you you would consider surgery and you realize that that doesn't work. But this is huge, I think, the fact that after a year of chronic pain, it's really not physiological. It's, it's in your mind more. There's more well, mind sure. control available for you. Yeah, it's not. It's actually not mind control. Cause remember, if you try not to think about something, you actually can't control your mind. Right. So we find out that the unconscious brain has been documented to be one million times stronger than the conscious brain. So that's where talk therapy, for instance, can't work because, again, it's a million to one ratio. So we go more into what's called somatic tools. We simply calm down, relax, shift sensations, and that's how the process works. The talk therapy alone, again, I'm, I'm offer support and wisdom and guidance, but remember, the talking alone actually really never fixes the pain. Wow, you know, this is the perfect time for a break for us. So you've been listening to Your Family's Health on the Voice of Nassau Community College at 90.3 WHPC. This is Joan Buckley and Dr. David Hanscom, and we're going to continue talking about what's in the new book, Back in Control, after this short break. Music is a bridge between the material and the spiritual. My name is Harvey Lauer, and I'm 82. As a blind person, you have to be aware that nobody can tell you what you can or can't do. You really have to try things. My folks got me a little radio in 1940, and that was the best Christmas present I ever got. When I was 11 years old is when I started to uh, play music, play the piano, and then the accordion, and then the cello. My wife, who was also blind, was a good cook. When she died, that's when I started Meals on Wheels. America, let's do lunch. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. WHPC. Welcome back to your family's health. This is Joan Buckley, and we welcome back our guest, Dr. David Hanscom. Now, Dr. Hanscom, before the break, we were talking about um, trying to almost retrain the brain a bit to not allow the pain pathway to go through. Is that kind of what we're trying to do? We're trying to get a different part of our brain to work, which will distract it. And I know I'm being a little bit picky here, but the hardest part is that you can't control the pathways. In other words... I know this. I'm really having a hard time wrapping my mind around this. Right. But remember, for instance, like I was an average trumpet player in high school, but not bad. But obviously I don't play trumpet anymore and I can't really do it, but I could relearn it pretty quickly. And I could fire up those pathways. So with pain pathways, the same thing, they're permanent. They're always going to be there. The more you try to fight fight them or solve them, you're actually giving them neurological attention to reinforce them. As you truly separate and direct your brain a different direction, as the new pathways develop, you're simply using the pain pathways less. 
So as you learn to live with uncomfortable sensations, whether it's anxiety, frustration,